In May 2009, seven astronauts flew to the Hubble Space Telescope aboard Space Shuttle Atlantis, bringing to the Alien Observatory new batteries, a new camera, and spare parts to fix broken hardware. It was the fifth servicing mission to Hubble and the final planned repair opportunity for the telescope. The astronauts brought more than replacement parts with them, however. They also carried an IMAX camera to space to document their mission. Just a month before Hubble's 20th birthday comes Hubble 3D, a new documentary film directed by Tony Myers. Here to discuss the film is Tony Myers and the mission's commander, Scott Altman. Thank you both for joining us. Great to be here. Our pleasure. So Tony, what about this mission appealed to you as a filmmaker? Well, first of all, it, I wanted to make a film about Hubble that uh, told the life story of Hubble, or as much of it as we could do in our time frame. And uh, of course, this was the final service mission. And I knew that there were a lot of interesting spacewalks and really challenging, in fact, the most challenging spacewalks uh, ever to be performed um, were going to happen on it, so I knew it was going to be ex exciting. And, and Scott, uh, this is your fourth trip into yes. space. Was there anything different for you this time in terms of feeling added pressure because the scientific stakes were so high and everyone was watching from the ground? Well, I think that's the key point. We knew on my last mission that there were future servicing missions planned, and while there's always a challenge to get stuff done, you thought, well, someone else could finish if we had to. On this one, we knew it was the final trip, last chance. Hubble's been such an incredible instrument. We all wanted to do as much as we could to put it in as great a shape as it could be for it to continue its voyage of discovery. And Tony, uh, if, if you would talk about some of the challenges that uh, you faced as a filmmaker for whom so many of the shots are out of your control. You're on the ground. The telescope is in the hands of the astronauts. I'm sorry, the camera's in the hands of the astronauts. We do train about eight months out from the flight, and we develop a scene list, a uh, kind of wish list of shots based on our observations of their training for the spacewalks in the pool. And um, the challenges really are only the timeline. Um, uh, we, of course, there's a sunrise and sunset every 90 minutes, and we know that. If they get behind on this tightly scripted script, um, then our best shots may wind up being in the dark, where we can't shoot. But we also know that's a possibility, so we do contingency planning in the list as well. And um, no, I totally trust them. We train them to be do um, cinematographers and directors. And we also say if an alien flies up and puts his face in the window just because it's not on the list, don't not shoot it. You know, it's you're the directors, and uh, ultimately, the decisions are in your hands. I see. And in terms of working in 3D, how does that change that process of shooting a film? Is there an actual technical difference? Well, there is a technical difference, a, a big one in the case of the camera we flew in the cargo bay, which is the IMAX 3D. Uh, cargo bay camera. That carries a mile of film. It's a single load. You can't change it out in, in the vacuum. Um, and that yields eight minutes of 3D film. Uh, that's because it's shooting both the left eye and the right eye for 3D uh, that are normally on two strips on one piece of film. And so that's not a lot. Eight minutes, you have to plan it out very carefully. All the footage in the film that we see that's the, the payload bay camera, that's taken from eight minutes of raw footage? That's correct. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. yeah a lot of Never. pressure not to leave too much on the cutting room floor no, when no, we're shooting no. it. No, no, no. Absolutely, they did a s bad pun, but a stellar job. <laughs> and Tony, uh, in the film there are some very wonderful uh, three-dimensional fly-throughs. If you would just talk a little bit about how those were made and, and how much uh, emphasis was put on keeping those scientifically accurate. I wanted to do two things. I wanted to explore a phenomenon that was familiar to most people in the night sky, even if they're only part-time, uh, uh, you know, stargazers, and that turned out to be the Orion Nebula because most people are familiar with Orion's belt as something. So I wanted to to start there, and that also turned out to be a very huge data set of Hubble's. Um, it's actually, when you combine the three data sets that we used, it's a billion pixels worth of information. And, uh, and uh, so that was one, and we used you know, one for the approach, and then another data set in, in the interior for the um, 
uh, trapezium region where all the little baby solar systems are and um, a third for the accretion disk. And uh, we combined all of those with uh, a software program called Verter, Virtual Director, that allows you to plot a flight path through the data. But it's all real data. There, there isn't any, um, you know, just fo straight phony CGI in there. Uh, and the other, the other concluding se sequence is one that I wanted to do to try and convey in uh, the simplest way possible the scale of the universe. And uh, uh, so we, in that one we fly from uh, the Milky Way out past Andromeda and then into the Virgo cluster. Each time we pass something we're going from a dozen galaxies to 2,000 galaxies to a billion galaxies. So. Now in the film, uh, partly because of the scale, it's very easy to, I mean, you and your fellow astronauts are up on the screen in huge proportions, and you look like people who are about to do something very serious and, and possibly dangerous, and that's not a side of space flight that we get to see very often. Is that, are there, are there a lot of nerves before you launch? Well, I think uh, everybody is focused. That's what I, I talk to folks. I want to, oh, let's put our game face on. We're going out to do something. We want to make sure we're all ready to meet this challenge head on. Uh, it's going to take a lot of concentration and focus to get up there, to get to the telescope, and then to do the spacewalks. There's also a time to relax and sort of recharge your batteries, but uh, I think it's important that we were all ready to go and we got there. And as a veteran of four space flights, would you like to see the space shuttle's life extended beyond its, its current uh, four, I suppose, four more launches? Four more flights right now. The shuttle is an amazing, amazing vehicle. Its capability to be reusable, to take so much payload to orbit and bring it home, uh, something that doesn't exist anywhere else on the planet right now. Transitions are always hard when you move from something you know to something that you don't, but they're also important to make progress, to add capability, and I'm hopeful that we can make that transition safely and uh, find a new path both to low Earth orbit and beyond, to go back to the moon and on to Mars. And if space tourism becomes a reality anytime soon, would you be itching to get back up there? Uh, you know, John Grunsfeld says he's happier in space than anywhere else, and you can see it in the movie with the big grin on his face when he comes in from a spacewalk. I feel that way a lot myself, too. It is an incredible adventure, and I'd love to be a part of it again. Maybe next time, take my wife and kids along. Me too, please. Yeah, and Tony too. <laughs> Which is a great thing about IMAX is because it gives you the chance to share that experience with uh, people who can't go, my family. To be there sitting in the movie theater with my wife and son sitting next to me was really a special experience for me last night. Thank you very much. Oh, great. It's been, Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to both of you. I well, enjoyed it. It was fun Thanks. for us.